Hi, I'm Scott Sipker. And I'm Kelly Kramer. Welcome to a special adventure edition of Iowa Outdoors. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. The Vredenberg Foundation of Sheraton, Iowa. Mid-American Energy, helping to harness renewable sources of electricity through their investment in wind power. Information is available at midamericanenergy.com. Mid-American Energy, obsessively, relentlessly at your service. Iowa Communications Network. The ICN is committed to the enhancements of distance learning and continues to meet the demands for greater access of high-speed internet by educational users. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Welcome to a special edition of Iowa Outdoors. Throughout our four seasons, we've shown you some adventurous ways to explore our state. Through the air, on the water, and even underground. First up, we reintroduce you to a trio of kiteboarding islands. Let's go airborne with them on Rathbun Lake, where a stiff breeze can be a huge asset when you're on the water. You look at, at the sport and you think, well, that looks like fun and interesting. But then when you actually are on the board with the kite and you're part of the whole thing, it's a thrill. You, you, you just, you feel it running through your body. Combine water skiing with kite flying, and you have the sport of kiteboarding. Since 2001, the IKO, or International Kiteboarding Organization, has certified over 410,000 kiteboarders worldwide, with over 40,000 new kiteboarders certified each year. With Iowa being ranked as the 10th windiest state, you would expect to see a lot of participation in the sport. But it turns out that the best conditions for kiteboarding don't usually occur during warm summer days. A gusty, drizzly, cloudy day isn't everybody's idea of an opportunity to have fun, but it turns out to be a perfect day for these kite boarders. Well, it's kind of gusty uh, conditions right now. It's a meter saying uh, kind of 15 to 17, 15 to 20, and it's supposed to be gusting, you know, between 30 and 45. So it's a little difficult conditions because there's such a range in the wind. The best conditions for kiteboarding in Iowa are in the spring and fall, when air and water temperatures demand the use of wet or dry suits. But it's also when the winds are blowing their hardest. Big winds are great. We like more wind, the better. We would like it to be a little steadier than today. This isn't ideal because there's such a range. So you really have to manage your kite well in those conditions because you can just get lofted up in the air and blown all the way to Centerville. Historians believe that the Chinese were building kites over 3,000 years ago, with the first written account of kite flying documenting how during a war a Chinese general flew a kite over a city to measure how far he would need to tunnel in order to be past enemy defenses. The most famous kite flyer would have to be Benjamin Franklin, who flew a kite in 1752 during a thunderstorm to prove lightning was electricity. Since he managed to avoid electrocution, Franklin also proved and he was very lucky. And in the 1800s, in an effort to avoid the horse tax and move from horsepower to kite power, George Pocock used large kites to propel boats and carts. It took, however, nearly a century and a half for kites to be paired with surfboards, thus creating a new extreme sport. very addictive. You just, it's such a sensation. It's not exactly flying, but it feels like you're almost, and then when you do a jump and you're floating up there and then float back down, 
it's, it's exhilarating. Really amazing. It's exhilarating. There's the control of the kite, there's watching the wind, there's the board on your feet and how the water is and what the wave conditions are. So there's a lot going on, so your mind is involved in it and also you get a huge adrenaline hit from the excitement of it all. It's the wind and the water and you, birds flying by, and you know, it's an amazing experience. There's no noise in terms of a motor or anything like that, so it's a very uh, great experience in terms of being out in nature too. Because kiteboarding is an extreme sport, injuries and even fatalities occur. Just like you would never jump out of a plane with a parachute without knowing what you're doing, kiteboarding you really need instructions. It can be a very safe sport if you know what you're doing, so get lessons from a qualified instructor. Don't try it on your own unless you're with someone who really knows what they're doing. Since the day we were shooting was quite gusty, my first lesson in kiteboarding, mercifully, came with both feet planted firmly on dry ground. emphasize the importance of lessons and safety, but it isn't actually that hard a sport to learn. Once you get the essential elements of it down, the progress is very quick. Because the best winds for kiteboarding occur in Iowa when air and water temperatures keep most people off the water, Frank, Carl, and Peter often have the lake to themselves. We always have Rathman pretty much to ourselves from, you know, Labor Day to Memorial Day. There's nobody, uh, there's nobody here. So uh, we get to see all the wildlife, the geese, and the Iowa pelicans. It is, it's really beautiful being out here. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is 11,500 acres of water, give or take. And we, and here we are, there's three of us. That's, that's the extent so of it. You're seeing there's I room for some more. There, there's there, a little bit of room. Yeah, yeah, we're not overcrowded yet. You know, <laughs> we can take a few. Uh, two. Yeah, right. <laughs> After that, it's too crowded. <laughs> Find a dose of history and geology in Winnesheek County in northwest Iowa at the longest cave in the upper Midwest. Our Iowa Outdoors crew climbed down into this spelunker subterranean paradise, an underground grotto known as Coldwater Cave. If you close your eyes and picture a mental image of Iowa, this is likely not what comes to mind. A massive underground cave system stretching for miles underneath the karst topography of northeast Iowa. Coldwater Cave is kind of a cave uh, in a glass by itself. Um, you don't find uh, things like this in Iowa, especially underneath a cornfield or a pasture. You just don't expect to see it. Um, Size-wise, it's, it's so huge. Um, main passage is so big and large. It's like a subway tunnel. Most Iowa caves are uh, small, wet, muddy, and uh, not really pleasant. Despite its size, the conditions and means of descending into Coldwater Cave are not for the casual tourist. The crew of Iowa Outdoors met up with members of the Iowa Grotto, a seasoned group of cavers intent on safely sharing the subterranean wonders of our state. Tucked inside a modest shed and bunkhouse rests the main human-built entrance to cold water. A metal tube and ladder descending 100 feet into the darkness below. I'm thinking, don't miss a step. Make sure each uh, there's something below my foot every time I put the weight on it, and uh, it should be fine. When you finally get down here, there's a little bit of relief. Double check that the ground's there. And then uh, it was great. I had a nice private moment just kind of coming over here, and it was completely dark. I couldn't see anything. And I just pressed the button on my headlamp, and all of a sudden it just seemed to go forever. You know, it was this beautiful, like, awe-inspiring moment, just really very, very humbling. Can't wait to go down there and uh, see what else is there. The absolute awe of an alien environment is nearly as eye-opening as the water temperature, hence its name. Coldwater Cave resembles an Iowa stream with water levels that fluctuate due to rainfall or snowmelt that eventually dumps into the nearby Coldwater Creek. Our journey 
planned for the frigid winter days of February, came amidst an untimely thaw. Raising the water level to our waistlines and pumping icy snowmelt beneath the topsoil and through the cave. We have a spotless, actually, safety record. We've had just very few minor injuries over the years. We watch the weather. Just like today, we're not taking you in very deep. Chances of spring runoff, water levels coming up. Water temperature, air temperature, you've noticed even some of you are starting to feel effects, early effects of hypothermia. Uh, basic caving requires a hard hat and at least three light sources. Here we go to a wetsuit. Those wetsuits help by creating a thin barrier of body heat and warmer water next to the skin. But our guides peg the day's water temperature near 37 degrees, with air temperature at a balmy 47. We head upstream to higher ground, and I realize that safely traveling a small section of this cave takes time and patience. This is a beautiful area, but you also got to realize you can get a long ways into this cave, have a problem, and it can get very serious. I think you've all noticed just getting back out of here if you had somebody injured would be a major undertaking. So we've, we've always stressed safety up here, and we will continue to. If you can safely navigate cold water, slippery rocks, and icy water flow, you'll discover some spectacular scenery. A mix of formations dot the landscape, many of which were developed by mineral-laden water over thousands of years. Some descend as stalactites from the ceiling or stalagmites from the cave floor, while newer formations like these soda straws are just beginning to take shape. The earliest sediments that have been dated in the cave are around a quarter million years old. Scientists would consider this a fairly young cave, just based on a variety of technical indicators. This is the best place in cold water cave to view fossils. These are crinoids, also known as celloids. They're more than 450 million years old. From fossils to flowstone, Coldwater Cave can present a variety of photographic opportunities. I've seen probably eight, nine miles of the whole thing on, on photography trips through the years. Scott Dankoff has photographed Iowa's tunnels and caves for nearly 20 years. But some of his best work originates from the crown jewel of Iowa's underground environment, cold water. Lighting's the biggest issue in this cave. Um, the walls, depending on where you're at in the cave, uh, dark colors eat your light, uh, the water, uh, eats your light, um, you have to use larger flashes, um, carry more gear, everything has to be in uh, waterproof boxes. Um, large passages like we're in now, not a big deal. Carry a tripod and a, and a pelican box is what we use most of the time. You get into small passages, hands and knees, in the water, crawling, it's a whole different thing. To date, explorers have discovered nearly 20 miles of winding passages at Coldwater Cave. It's a journey that began more than 40 years ago. Discovered in the 1960s by a trio of divers near Coldwater Creek, the cave captured the attention of Iowans and state government. Local farmers Ken and Wanda Flatland had suffered numerous sinkholes on their land and heard stories of other farmers that had lost livestock down mysterious holes. Experts later discovered Coldwater Cave ran directly underneath a section of the Flatland farm. With financial backing from the state legislature, the Iowa Geological Survey drilled a 94-foot hole for visitors to descend into the largest known cave system in the upper Midwest. But state officials quickly discovered it was not a casual tourist destination and scrapped plans for lighted concrete walkways. The raw nature of Coldwater Cave has kept spelunkers coming back time and time again. Divers say the network of passages will still be here long after they're gone but concede the cave faces challenges from human contact and runoff from farm fertilizers. So you think, you know, we're in ag country, we're not too far from a college town, but you are truly in a wilderness, you know, where once you enter the cave and travel for some time, you can be two or three miles from the nearest exit, which, you know, from the definition of wilderness, it certainly is. It's the ultimate Iowa outdoors. In a way it is. Yeah. A bit underground, but yeah. It is. Next up, a story that gives us a bird's eye view of the Iowa landscape. We take to the skies with one Iowan whose favorite outdoor activity involves a very large fan, a parachute, 
and a whole lot of courage. In rural Madison County, the hum of a distant motor may not be a combine in the midst of autumn harvest. The growing buzz can envelop a valley alongside the Middle River, and once it descends below the horizon, a unique image suddenly appears. A young man floating underneath an expansive parachute with a massive fan strapped to his back. This is Jason Jasnos, a longtime skydiver who discovered the wide open expanses of Iowa were perfect for a burgeoning aerial endeavor known as power paragliding. Know your comfort zone. Know where you are, you know, comfortable enough to fly. Um, I have a, a lot higher of a comfort zone than you probably might. I'll fly in a little bit more turbulence than you might. It takes years of getting comfortable with that feeling of being in turbulence, knowing how to handle it, and just enjoying the flight regardless. Flying alongside Jason is a visual feast, particularly in the midst of fall color. The California transplant hugs the tree-lined valleys, lies only feet above countless golden acres of corn, and provides a bird's eye view of Madison County's famous covered bridges. Strapped with multiple cameras on board, Jason's images are one of a kind, but his long tailored abilities are what keep him safe and hugging the surface of the earth in a powered paraglider has its dangers. That's the danger zone when you fly low, okay? But when I'm flying low, I'm constantly aware of where the winds are and my relationship to objects with that wind, okay? So that keeps me out of a lot of trouble. Jason is a thrill seeker turned teacher. His launching pad at the Winterset Airport serves double duty as a training ground for prospective clients, each hoping to fly over the Iowa countryside. When I saw Jason flying around and I'd watch him um, coming in for landings or, or just taking off. Any days when we'd be on the ground, we couldn't skydive because of clouds or winds. He could be out flying. A young skydiver like Jason Glaza was lured to Iowa PPG by witnessing seemingly effortless flight with a powerful motor at your back. Once you get control of the wing, just keep controlling it. And then when I tell you to turn, go ahead and turn. But for potential paragliders, weeks of tedious training begins with chute control, especially at takeoff. Powered gliders must have expert control of their parachute. Their hands not only control the direction and rate of descent, but the acceleration of their propeller. It's a balance that takes practice, practice, and more practice. Keep driving until the lines come up over your head. At that point, you can let go of the A's and your back should be as straight as possible at this point. While PPG is an under the radar extreme sport in Iowa, it does fall under federal regulation. Um, it's an experimental aircraft, so the FAA has regulations what we can fly, where, and where and when. And you follow those regulations, and you go through proper training, and it's, I'd say it's absolutely safe. When we met Glaza, he had spent weeks honing his skills on the ground. This cost uh, $7,719. The Iowa school teacher hoped a calm autumn evening would be perfect for his first flight. He is doing great. He's a, he's a A student. I like, uh, I like his ambition. He's very motivated. And that's what it takes. It takes a, a, a certain amount of gumption to really you know, make this thing happen. So, With his own teacher, Jason, on the ground, coaching his student via radio, Glaza began his first solo flight, drifting above the farm fields near Winterset. It takes a moment to adjust to that mindset that I'm flying. Yeah, I'm flying. Okay, here we go. You know, and that after that, it's like, wow. You just start soaking it all in, and it becomes uh, a spiritual experience just about. Stay out of the way. Climbed a little more gradually, not as aggressively. But uh, no, you, you get a feel for it real quick. It's, it's a blast. Oh, man. I love watching them fly for the first time. They're just feeling their wings. The lessons Jasnos gives in Winterset are economical and designed for entry-level beginners, for Iowans hoping to witness the state from a bird's eye view. Glaze's first flight is one of the reasons Jason Jasnos fostered Iowa PPG into a homegrown business. He wants to share his experiences and the natural beauty of Iowa with everyone. Beautiful flying, just 
every the, everywhere it was just colors and you know just butter air you know yeah I think I might have to take another flight Iowans of all ages can fly through the treetops above the Mississippi River in Dubuque for a one-of-a-kind view of an historic park and picturesque valley. The region's hilly topography is ideal for an aerial tour on Iowa's first full-scale zipline course. All right, let's do it. Here we go. <laughs> The hum of Iowans flying through the treetops is now commonplace on the ridgeline of Dubuque. Ready? Yep. All right. With links varying from 300 to 800 feet, Sky Tours Iowa has created a premier zip course for young and old. Our only limitations are because this is a gravity zip line, as you can't weigh more than 270 pounds and you can't weigh less than 70 pounds but any age can come out here and enjoy it. It's designed to be an experience, to have an opportunity to be outside, to uh, be outside with your friends, your family, and to just enjoy the experience. The Sky Tour course contains seven separate zip lines, each one providing a different treetop view of Union Park. The gravity course begins with a pair of simple zips, aptly named Bunny and Rapid Run. Each was designed to ease first-timers into walking off an Iowa slope. Those first steps above the timbered valley build confidence for the most novice visitors, even if their faces don't show it yet. Trails weave the course together, giving guests an outdoor hike to complement the high-speed zips. Next up on the Sky Tours course is Skyline. A hillside platform seems introductory enough until you begin a 400-foot land-to-tower flight. The destination? Sky Tours Lookout Tower and its panoramic view of Horseshoe Hollow. The tour's sole tower also begins a trek back in time. The valley below includes relics from the early 1900s and a tale of triumph and tragedy. From farmland to parkland to the Mammoth Theater, this location in the hills above Dubuque serves as an Iowa touchstone. Its story begins more than 120 years ago. In 1891, a Dubuque farmer sold a parcel of his land to a local electric company that would later be known as General Electric, then Union Electric. The company would spend $30,000 to construct the Mammoth Theater in this picturesque valley and claim the venue as the largest west of the Mississippi. The Mammoth Theater allowed people to see and hear musical programs free of charge. For 10 cents per person, a local trolley system shuttled visitors back and forth from downtown Dubuque to Northeast Iowa's premier entertainment destination. Hold uh, approximately uh, 1,500 uh, viewers of whatever shows they had going on. They had vaudeville, um, different plays, um, acts, Guy Lombardo, uh, a lot of big time bands and that were down here. And it's interesting because the way you see the theater now, you're only seeing half of it. The way it stood when the park was open, it had spanned the valley. And the back side of it, which would have been over on this side, was open. So you could sit on bleachers up on the hillside and view whatever entertainment was inside for free. Swimming and wading pools lured families to spend fair weather days at what was known as Union Park. The valley was an embodiment of early 1900s idealism, and tragically, the location of shocking heartbreak. On July 9, 1919, potential rain showers turned into a rapid downpour on the ridgeline above the Mississippi. The Mammoth Theater inadvertently served as a dam, blocking the liquid's dispersion and creating a 20-foot-high wall of water destined for destruction. The valley flooded, some were unable to escape, five park visitors perished. In less than two hours, nearly four inches of rain fell that afternoon in 1919. It was the beginning of the end for Union Park. The tale of Union Park is perhaps the greatest surprise on the Sky Tours course. 
More than a zip line and hiking tour, visitors literally fly over history and a time long forgotten, but still visible to the naked eye. And that's part of the design of the layout of, of our zip line, is to be able to identify the artifacts in the park so we can tell the history of this. A fascinating history that's been a, that was a big part of Dubuque for uh, over 40 years. Without massive theaters, rainwater can flow naturally through this valley and visitors safely travel with trained zip guides. On Lookout Tower, you'll see the original foundation of Mammoth Theater, 45 feet above the river valley. And with no other option but zipping oh back God. to the ridge line, the course continues. Oh, I did not like that one. The next zips, known as airstrike and ground speed, take visitors deep into the valley timber for lines that hug between the treetops. One last hike to high ground brings the tour to its conclusion, and the longest line of them all. The dual zip line is 800 feet, nearly three football fields long, allowing friends to zip side by side across the valley. It's been great for our community. It's been great for the kids. We've had uh, many opportunities. We're even collaborating with the uh, public school system to bring the kids in here and uh, do some teamwork and just have a good time out here in the, in the uh, park. It seems there's something for everyone in the treetops above the view. Action, outdoor exploration, and history for the entire family. That wraps up the special adventure edition of Iowa Outdoors. These are just a few of our favorite features from our first four seasons. You can find even more online at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. We'll leave you with another look at some of the many adventures we've shared with you right here on Iowa Outdoors. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. The Vredenberg Foundation of Sheraton, Iowa. Mid-American Energy, helping to harness renewable sources of electricity through their investment in wind power. Information is available at midamericanenergy.com. Midamerican Energy, obsessively, relentlessly at your service. Iowa Communications Network. ICN's connectivity offers Iowa's rural hospitals and clinics access to telemedicine opportunities. Iowans can eliminate distance barriers by receiving medical treatment closer to home using remote specialists located miles away. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.